Hello and welcome to Dialogue. China's nuclear power development has been in the spotlight recently following a record-breaking approval of 11 nuclear reactor permits in a single year since 2015. The efforts are regarded as a move to accelerate China's green transition as the country is aiming to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. What a role does nuclear power play in China's green transition? What opportunities and challenges does China's nuclear industry face in the foreseeable future? And what does China's green transition mean for the world? Join us for our discussion today from Beijing. I'm Xu Qinduo. Joining me today are Professor Zha Daojun from Peking University, Wu Changhua, Chair of Governing Council of Asia Pacific Water Forum, and Stephen Izell, Vice President of Global Innovation Policy at Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Welcome to the show. So Changhua, I will start Thank with you. you. So uh, you know, if you look at China's nuclear development, of course, the approval of 11 reactors this time around, and also if you read the policy documents, it says, I quote here, uh, the need to accelerate the construction of a nuclear power. Uh, so you see this kind of attitude, the change of attitude somehow from previously uh, saying that uh, you know, China should develop nuclear power in a manner that is you know, safely, orderly, but this time around it used the word like accelerate in an explicit way. Do you sense a change of attitude? No, I wouldn't see a, a major change of the attitude from policymakers' perspective. Rather, it's on top of uh, previous uh, positioning, which we call like safely, actively, safely, efficiently, as well as sustainably. And on top of that, now we are adding another word, uh, speedily. Uh, so accelerating meaning we need to speed up, speed up the efforts to deploy uh, nuclear power generation, really add more non-fossil fuel uh, power generation capacity uh, to the overall energy system uh, as quickly as possible. And that happens in the country, in the, in the backdrop that China has been on its track to deliver its uh, Paris Agreement commitments. And at this very moment, so we are literally uh, you know, at the point of peaking, achieving peaking of em emissions before 2030. Of course, down the road, you know, achieving carbon neutrality before 2060. In that context, uh, China's look at China's scale of emissions, look at the targets made already. China needs to accelerate its clean energy transition. And from that perspective, nuclear power generation seems to be unavoidable, must have uh, you know, part of the solution into the energy system. So that's there's no surprising at all why China policymakers are taking this step forward uh, to really accelerate the deployment. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Jia, so uh, this, this is, uh, you know, we, we know like uh, since 2011, uh, the Japanese Fukushima uh, nuclear meltdown, there's a abrupt halt of approving uh, new reactors in China. Of course, they resumed the approval in 2019, uh, and now this time around 11 reactors, uh, so the largest uh, a number being approved since 2015, people say. We do, there is, um, let's say, speeding up the development of a nuclear power plant here? Well, there are several timeline uh, dates you wish to pay attention to. One is that um, you said 2011, the Fukushima incident. But roughly three years thereafter, I do believe there was already a conclusion here in China that uh, technologically speaking, a disaster of that mag magnitude could be uh, under handled. And also the, a big part of this was uh, the extent of the disaster in Fukushima had to do with the uh, management. And possibly that's because you have, um, you know, here in Asia, we have a uh, exchange mechanism among the scientists, regulators involving China, Japan, South Korea, and even the Association of Southeast Asian countries. And another reason I would think for the uh, approval this time is that um, this, uh, the, I could gather from indirect knowledge is that the Chinese nuclear companies, um, including those ones that were sanctioned by uh, the United States since Mr. Trump came to office, found ways to resolve some of the technological uh, 
um, issues by themselves or in collaboration with other companies um, other than American companies. A major third factor is that the 27 uh, nuclear power plants under construction, that's already investment made at this time with uh, round of time, you have a slowdown of the economy. We, we cannot go back to uh, uh, increased investment in airports and uh, high-speed rails. Uh, actually, the country is cutting back investment in um, city subways. So nuclear uh, is, uh, at this point of time, the approval is also a boost to well, at least confidence in the management of the economy. Well, Stephen, compared to other nuclear power, uh, let's say powers, you know, U.S., France, e example, where is China, uh, you know, in terms of the numbers, in terms of the generation, uh, etc.? Uh, China's nuclear power build-out over the past half decade has been very impressive. In fact, China has deployed as many new nuclear reactors over the past 10 years as the United States did over the past 40. Uh, the country has tripled its nuclear capacity over the past 10 years. And if current rates hold between China's commissioning of new nuclear plants, as well as America's scheduled decommissioning of older plants, then China should surpass the United States in total nuclear power production by the year 2030. Now, the share of national energy production, certainly France is still one of the global leaders, 70% of, 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 of electricity in France is generated through nuclear power. Um, but it's clear uh, with China's build out, uh, it will join the ranks of France, the United States, others like Russia as leaders globally uh, in uh, production of electricity from nuclear power. Stephen, uh, if you look at uh, the comparison you know, in China, the nuclear power only accounts for less than 5% of the uh, you know, total power generation. Uh, as you said, in France, for example, 70%, uh, in, in, in the US, 20%, uh, in the European continent, probably 20% in general, uh, even globally, it's 10%. So can we say there's, there's a potential, I mean, uh, for China to even reach this you know, global standard of like 10% in terms of a power uh, energy mix here? Mix here? Well, as I understand, even China's build out of 150 reactors by 2035 will only bring nuclear's contribution to the Chinese grid to about 15 percent. Uh, so that's a stat substantial improvement. You know, in, in 2022, only 3.8 percent of nuclear power or uh, power in China was produced uh, through nuclear reactors. Um, so, you know, that does still represent, um, you know, a quintupling of uh, the share of uh, electricity being generated in China through nuclear power. And of course, uh, the, the, you know, historically, uh, Chinese nuclear reactors were based on an American design, the Westinghouse Electric AP-1000. Uh, what China is innovating now are new types of nuclear reactors. Uh, the uh, Generation 4 uh, International Forum has defined six new types of fourth generation nuclear reactors. China is the only country currently building out all six of these reactors. So in the future, China really seeks indigenous nuclear reactor designs and then to um, join Russia and Sweden and the US uh, and France as major players in export markets of nuclear technology. Uh, I understand the Chinese government has set a goal uh, to sell at least 30 nuclear reactors to its One Belt, One Road partners here in the next decade or so. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll touch upon that later. Uh, in terms of innovation, of course, the new uh, reactors there. Uh, Changhua, uh, you know, of course, nuclear energy uh, offers this uh, round-the-clock power uh, that is clean or seen as clean and can easily slide into networks in place of uh, gas and coal-fired supplies. Um, so is that why, you know, we are developing nuclear uh, powers here so as to, of course, to play a role in reducing or in fighting climate change here? Well, that's only part of the reason. That's for sure. That's part of the strength of nuclear power generation. I do want to bring back another very important driver why China is uh, decided to accelerate the deployment of nuclear power generation at this very moment, actually. Uh, it's really because China's readiness. If you look at the technology uh, in itself, if you look at uh, the highly integrated supply chain, if you look at China's advanced manufacturing capability, as well as human power, right? We need talents, we need people, uh, engineers, we need the safety, uh, you know, engineers, uh, personnel, and uh, risk management people. Literally, so the hard, 
hardware and the software are pretty much sort of ready. Uh, so China, this is another major driver. It's really the readiness really also adding to the momentum to accelerate the deployment. Professor Jai, you know, the Fukushima nuclear accident, you know, set an uh, abrupt halt of approving nuclear power projects. As we said earlier, uh, you know, now uh, industry insiders are expecting, uh, you know, there's a golden, there will be a golden period uh, for the next few years for China's nuclear development uh, and the green transition. Uh, is that the case? In my research on nuclear energy management here in China, I did learn, number one, the Fukushima reactor was actually uh, first uh, put in place in the 1950s. Like Stephen just said, uh, you know, we, now we are in um, the fourth generation, the Fukushima or probably the second generation or even first generation. And secondly, I, I do understand during the course of the use of the Fukushima reactor, uh, there were some disputes between its original provider, G General Electric, GE, and the Japanese operators uh, over uh, what it would take to alter some of the components. So there are lots of details. So in other words, we shouldn't just say, well, because it happened in Fukushima, it will be repeated elsewhere. Also, you have a truly powerful uh, the exceptionally powerful um, tsunami that, uh, that 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 hit the Fukushima plant. So that's the, together. That's one point. The second point is that uh, here in China, in addition to what Tang Hua said, we we need to meet climate change commitments. But I would think that's really a result rather than a purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, let's face it, especially when you look at Jiangsu, Zhejiang. Fujian, Guangdong, these provinces, they have really two choices, you know, as the, uh, under, under the condition of their energy demand uh, sustaining or increasing. And also here in China, we can't really allow the price of electricity to fluctuate the political market. Then that leaves those provinces two choices. One is coal-fired power. The other is, sorry, that's going to be nuclear. Uh, so, Stephen, you know, you, you, earlier you mentioned uh, about the Chinese uh, innovation, the fourth generation uh, reactors. Uh, uh, tell us, you know, what are the features of the latest, uh, say, fourth generation reactors? You know, like, are they, I expect it to be safer, obviously, and also are they more efficient or what are the outstanding features? Well, China over the past year was the first country in the world to formally deploy fourth generation nuclear reactor. This was the Xiadaoyang One power plant, uh, which uh, uses two helium gas-cooled pebble beds. Uh, there are six different types of fourth-generation nuclear reactors, but the essential point about them uh, is that whatever their design is, they use passive safety systems. This means they don't need to rely on electricity or pumps to shut down in the case of failure. And this was exactly the problem that was run into in Fukushima. Uh, they also use coolants other than the water, such as helium. They can operate at much higher temperatures. And in general, they produce you know, far less waste. Uh, they're much more environmentally friendly. I think the important point that I try to communicate to people in the United States is it, 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 you, you can't think of nuclear power today the way you thought of it in the 1950s. That would be like thinking that the insulin that diabetics take today is the same ground up pig pancreas that they took in the 1950s. These are foundationally different technologies, they're far safer, and we need to interpret them and understand their safety features in a much different way. Um, as I said, uh, there are multiple different types, um, uh, including uh, small modular reactors. Uh, these uh, uh, is an area where, where China is also leading, uh, having deployed uh, as well, or by October, we'll have deployed the first small modular reactor as well. So. Um, it, China really has stepped up its uh, capacity for innovation in advanced nuclear reactor designs. Now, the U.S. has these same designs, firms like Terra Power, like New Scale. We've actually been slowed down by the regulatory environment of the United States. Um, in fact, Congress just passed legislation last month trying to accelerate and streamline uh, advanced uh, permitting in the United States. Um, but, but, but China has really taken the lead uh, in deploying uh, these technologies as a growing stance. It's reported that there's a concern in the U.S. Uh, you know, Steve uh, saying that uh, you know, U.S. Uh, is some like 10 to 15 years behind China. They need to, to basically 
uh, learn from China the whole of government approach to develop uh, or to de uh, deploy these uh, nuclear power uh, plants. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Uh, you know, is there, a, <laughs> is there a point in saying that? Well, uh, w one of the reasons we, we wrote that uh, is that uh, the, these third generation nuclear reactors, that, which these designs have been around from Western Electric since for 20 years. And it wasn't until earlier this year that we actually brought our own technologies online in the Vogel three and four plants in Georgia that we've been working on for nearly two decades. Uh, but but yeah, on, on the advanced side of the equation, especially across these six different types of, of these fourth generation reactors, and these are example, molten salt reactors, lead cold fast reactors, uh, gas cooled, yeah, we don't have to go into all the technology. But the point is that you know, China is building all of these right now. We're building a couple of these designs. And you know, net net, uh, if we look at the, the, the trajectory of deployment and the pace of innovation, that's kind of where we got that 10 to 15 years behind uh, figure, which we mentioned in our recent report, which assessed uh, how innovative China is in nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Changhua, given you know, the, the relationship between China and the US, are we going to see a repeat of, um, you know, uh, say competition in this area, you know, between U.S. and China, like uh, like what happened in the, or what's happening in the semiconductor sector? I think, generally speaking, there is a fatigue, uh, not only I think among ourselves, but also globally, to really sort of you know exaggerating this U.S.-China competition sort of mentality. There, I really think, I personally think, we should put that on, you know, put that aside. Uh, for the sake of really the connectivity, you know, collective sort of destiny, common destiny for the future at this moment, particularly between U.S. and China. One thing I, you know, you, you asked Stephen about the U.S., right, the U.S., the sort of uh, capability, the policy, stuff like that. I do want to give credit uh, to the Biden, uh, uh, you know, Harris administration in terms of when they rolled out this RA, you know, this uh, infl Inflation Reduction Act there, uh, it's pretty much a sort of, I wouldn't say totally copied, but somehow a <laughs> simplified China's sort of really focus on industrial policy and in particular focusing on, you know, clean energy transition, look at the industrialization, you know, supply chain and look at the products, the market there. And uh, in that context, I think the nuclear new you know, nuclear technology, particularly new generation of nuclear power generation, actually is sort of included there as well. So I do want to give credit actually to uh, the U.S. government on that as well. Uh, the, another aspect, of course, uh, Professor Jai, is about safety. Uh, earlier you mentioned about you know safety is not an issue, uh, but uh, there is a uh, you know a voice or concern saying that China is going too fast. In expanding nuclear power, um, you know, there, the concern is like uh, whether there will be potential loopholes. Uh, so, uh, where do you stand? Do you think there's um, we are going too fast, or we should slow down? Well, everybody has an opinion about something, especially something that's as a bit mysterious to the general public as nuclear power. But my personal observation is that the Chinese management of nuclear power plants is too conservative. It shuts down these reactors too readily just for maintenance, simply because there is some specter of a malfunction. There were a lot of technical reports about it. If you go to the International Nuclear Association reports, the same technical concern, like in, in the US or French regulatory context, they would not shut down. Now, why are we investing so much, building so many power plants, but we're still nuclear as a percentage of actual generation is so low. One main reason is that they shut down these power reactors too quickly, I mean, too readily, and it takes a long time to come back. And in other words, frankly speaking, a lot of time there's a good deal of idling of the plants, and even waste of resources, because the whole uh, government policy requir uh, uh, the requirement is to be 100% absolutely safe. And safety is, of course, important. But it's also a uh, learning, you know, by doing. But nevertheless, uh, that said, I, I would think uh, it's not somehow China is doing it too quickly to to. Uh, Can I go Chindu, ahead? I I would like to please allow me to add a little bit of you know sort of uh, a different opinion uh, from uh, Professor Cha just now. I do appreciate the the precautionary attitudes at this very moment there. As we're talking about here, China is definitely accelerating. 
as I mentioned, I think it, this sort of readiness is a major driver actually uh, for this acceleration. But in the meantime, we had to admit the reality, the pace, right, is really fast. That's for sure. That's reality. But somehow, in order to further develop the nuclear power generation, the landscape into the energy system there, there are many issues, challenges there. You know, safety, of course, is the core piece of the puzzle. But in the meantime, we need to look at the technology, uh, you know, sophistication and, uh, you know, maintenance, emergency response, uh, spend the fuels with the management, whatever. So somehow, in order to get all the other pieces together in this ecosystem there, we do need it. It, it does take time, uh, right? And uh, so that's why I appreciate a little bit more, actually, uh, the precautionary sort of attitude uh, China is taking at this moment there. Some hopefully somehow will be learning quickly on this journey so that we'll be able to really unleash uh, the contribution of nuclear power generation to the overall energy transition uh, process. But as I said, there are many issues compared to other, uh, like a wind, solar, probably, you know, energy there that, you know, some uniquely for the nuclear power generation landscape there, we need to be really careful, precautious. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Steve, I want you to weigh in. If you look at, uh, for example, the record of last year, 2023, uh, you know, the, it said that China's nuclear power units achieved higher scores uh, you know, for the World Association of Nuclear Operators Comprehensive Index than that of, uh, say, US, Russia, France, in terms of power generation capacity and safety performance. The uh, um, question is, like, is, there, is there anything we can learn from each other in terms of ensuring the safety of operating nuclear power plants? Well, you know, as a first point, since much of China's nuclear reactor fleet Builder has occurred more recently, a stat like that does make sense, especially when you're considering yeah. that many of America's nuclear plants were put in place in the 70s, right? So, so when you hear like efficiency, it, it does make more sense that a, a set of newer plants would, 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 would score higher in, in, in those ways. Um, but yes, there are certainly um, areas of collaboration. Um, in fact, there's now a new Canada-US program to uh, work together for um, the, 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 the licensing, um, uh, you know, harmonizing the licensing requirements for fourth generation nuclear reactors. I know there's now a program in place between the United States and the European Union on this. Um, so we've talked about these are, you know, totally new reactor designs in many cases, this, this uh, you mentioned, um, the, this TMSR LF1 is going to be the world's first molten salt and thorium nuclear reactor. Uh, your Linglang Wang is, is the first SMR reactor. So yes, I think there's there's much that nuclear regulatory agencies across the world can do, um, you know, to um, you know understand these technologies, uh, to validate them, uh, and to um, put forward licensing regimes that uh, you know appropriately ensure public safety. Mm -hmm. Changhua, you know, the, the Chinese uh, side, you know, issued this document of accelerating the development of uh, nuclear power plants uh, against a large background, that is a green transition. Uh, so if you talk about that, you know, as of uh, the end of June 2024, the installed capacity of renewable energies in China has reached, uh, you know, like 1.6 uh, billion uh, kilowatts, you know, accounting for 50, more than 53 percent of China's total uh, installed capacity. And also, if you look at this, um, you know, like, I would say the reduction of uh, carbon em emission intensity uh, per unit of GDP, et cetera, uh, that's very impressive. I mean, we are talking about a 25, 35 percent reduction. Uh, tell us, you know, given China's goal of 2030, 2060, nu nuclear, this, uh, uh, you know, peaking on also neutrality, where are we now? There are reports, China, reports saying that China would be ahead of uh, 2030 to reach that goal of peaking of carbon uh, dioxide. Is that the case? Well, China definitely has been working really, really hard uh, to deliver its commitment. I think from power sector perspective, the decarbonization of power sector, uh, the trends the, has been really, really positive. Uh, as you mentioned, so uh, in May this year, now we have 53% of our electricity generated from renewable non-fossil fuels. And of course, we have the other 44% actually still generated from coal and fossil fuels there. We need to address that particular challenge uh, in order to achieve the target. 
Now, a lot of research studies, researchers actually have been really focused on this landscape about you know the level of the targets, uh, you know where China stands today, whether China will be able to deliver the targets, whether it's not ambitious enough, particularly at this moment. And if you look at the COP 29 and also of course in in, in in Baku this year, and also next year in Brazil, the COP 30 the number one priority for the global community you know, under the Paris Agreement is really to set the target for 2035. Uh, so there's no surprise. And uh, so you know, there's more attention really zooming in on China's efforts you know, and China's plans there as well. Now, put things in perspective. Uh, China has set targets already to peak coal and uh, by 2025. So addressing you know, sort of a shift, transition away from coal definitely has been uh, one of the major priorities, strategic priority focuses in China in order to achieve decarbonization uh, agenda there. Uh, I think we're getting there. And then, of course, look at the renewable energy, so the wind, wind installations. And now we're talking about the nuclear, the steps geared up efforts, actually acceleration of nuclear power generations there. So all the positive trends point to one particular conclusion. A lot of people say, oh, maybe China has already achieved a peak. Uh, peaking its emissions because the target we, commitment was set before 2030. So when exactly that's going to be? I said some analysis already said that China already peaked, or China will very close actually to maybe 2026 to peak there. So the next issue is really about okay, China is peaking its emissions. How how quickly it will be able to bend down the curve, right? The reductions, and that's where uh, it's a little a new contest actually. For China, of course, the global community's attention there as well to look at in the 2035 target, nationally determined commitments and DCs uh, to the Paris Agreement. And very important in your real life, how do we make sure on one side we need to deliver energy security? That's absolutely top priority in China. But in the meantime, to make sure to accelerate the decarbonization of the power sector in particular at this moment, besides, of course, other industrial agriculture sectors as well. And uh, so in that context, I think on one side, I feel relatively very optimistic mm -hmm. in terms of China achieving delivery is a first peaking target there. I think if not, we're not there yet. We're going to be there very soon, definitely before 2030. Uh, on that note, we come to the end for today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also watch us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time.